Turn with me to the Luke, Luke's Gospel. <laughs> We're giving uh, gospel messages from the Gospels in Luke 14. And we're going to read just a few verses from verse 15 to 24. But before I read that, I want to just ask a question. And the question is a pretty simple one, and that is this. <clears throat> Did anybody invite somebody to come today who didn't come? Okay. Did they have an excuse for not coming? Was it a good one? You think they missed out? <laughs> like it was, that was a pretty decent banquet, wasn't it? Yeah. I have to say, I've been coming to men's breakfast here for a long time. That was probably number one. It was really, really good. Thank you, by the way, for those that did it. Yeah. Appreciate it. But <laughs> I want to just keep that in the back of your mind. Inviting people, they don't know, and they've usually got excuses. I invited somebody, they had an excuse. Okay, so I'm going to read uh, from Luke 14, verse 15. It says, when one of them sat at meat with him, heard these things, he said to him, blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then said he unto him, a certain man made a great supper and bade many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, come. For all things are now ready. And they all, with one consent, began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. Another said, I bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and showed his law these things. And the master of the house, being angry, said to his servants, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor, the maimed, the halt, the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say to you that none of those men that were bidden shall taste of my soul. So very interesting in the light of what we're doing this morning. We've just had a wonderful banquet. And the Lord is speaking of a much better banquet. <clears throat> He's speaking of in the kingdom of God, a wonderful banquet that he has made it possible for everybody to be there. But a lot of people won't be there because they're full of excuses. And they don't respond to the invitation because they're full of excuses. And so it says here that they all, with one consent, began to make excuse. And it's interesting, since time began, man has always been making excuses. Back in the Garden of Eden, when man sinned and rebelled against God. Well, he had his excuses, right? It's the woman you gave me. It's all her fault, right? <clears throat> now he makes excuses for his sin and rebellion, for his refusal to accept God's gracious offer of the gospel. And also, even Christian men make excuses for their failure to really live for Christ. The world is full of men making excuses that's just the way it is so again we have to ask the question we don't know where everybody is this morning maybe you've heard the gospel many times and maybe you've never responded what's your excuse because there comes a time where you'll run out of time and then you won't have any excuses you'll stand before the Lord and so it's, it's good to just acknowledge <clears throat> that you're a sinner and respond in faith to what Jesus did on the cross so that you can come to the best banquet ever. <laughs> and uh, that's what we want people to do. But people are full of excuses. First of all, as we said, excusing sin. In the Garden of Eden, <clears throat> the beginning of time, it was the woman you gave me. 
In other words, it's not my fault. I'm not to blame for my own actions. You gave her to me. So really, God, it's your fault. If you hadn't given me that woman, I would never have done this, and <clears throat> everything would have been fine. <clears throat> How does that kind of thing play out today? Well, I don't know you know much about psychology, but psychology is about the art of excuses. Excusing people from their responsibility for their own actions. You see, it's the environment. If I was in a nice neighborhood, I wouldn't have done what I did. You know, there are people who live in the poshest houses do some of the most vile sins. <laughs> neighborhood is not an excuse. Blaming your companions. Well, I just fell in with the wrong crowd. As if you had no choice in who you hung around with, you know, you were just kind of sucked in and had no responsibility in it. And so, oh, I, it's just I fell into the wrong crowd. They led me astray. Like, you can say no. Like, you know, it's kind of, it's not a big word. It's not a hard word to learn. You can just say no, but uh, but we're just full of excuses. And then, of course, blaming God. You ever heard people say, well, you made me this way? Is it God made perverts the way they are. He didn't make people like that. It was a conscious consequence of their choices. See, it's time to stop making excuses <laughs> and admit that you're a hell-deserving sinner. I know that's hard. It kind of goes against our pride and our feelings of self-worth and all the rest of it. But you see, the Lord Jesus says, you will never seek a physician unless you acknowledge you're sick. Isn't that true? Only those that acknowledge they're sick will see. Well, the Lord Jesus is the great physician. He does more than heal bodies. He heals souls. And But to, to get that, you have to be honest. And you have to admit, I need help. Uh, I, I don't have it together. Uh, I, I, I can't live this life that you want me to live. I need you to save me. Nobody ever calls on the Savior until they first acknowledge that they're a sinner and need to be saved. And so, whatever we make excuses, it's going to put off receiving Christ. So another excuse, again, back in the garden, was the woman said, well, it was the serpent's fault. See, it was the devil that made me do it. Yeah, that's a good way of getting rid of personal responsibility, isn't it? You know, in the millennial kingdom, when Jesus reigns on earth for a thousand years, and the devil is bound and out of action, people will still sin and rebel. And they won't have the devil to blame it on. Isn't that interesting? You see, <clears throat> we excuse ourselves consistently and they, they don't hold up. <laughs> That's the problem. And so what about excuses for not responding to the gospel invitation? What we can say from this passage is God has prepared a heavenly banquet so much more wonderful than the one we've enjoyed this morning. And this has been good. That's going to be so much better. He has paid the entrance price so that you, a sinner, and go in and enjoy that banquet. Now, it was a high price he paid to make it possible for you to go there. And the price was the death of his son, Jesus Christ, on Calvary's cross. You see, he came into the world. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And the, re the way he saved sinners is by taking in his own body the punishment that we as <laughs> sinners deserved. Well, on Calvary's cross, the Bible says, he that knew no sin, he was perfectly sinless. He even said to his enemies, which of you should, can convince me of sin? And they, they had nothing to say. They walked away in silence. He was the spotless lamb of God. So he had no sin himself, but it says, he that knew no sin was made to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So what God did is he took your sin and my sin and laid it on his son and punished him as if he was the guilty one. 
so that you, the guilty one, if you trust in him, can go free. Now, that's the best offer that a man could ever have. Somebody else taking your punishment so that you can go free. Mm -hmm. And yet, people still make excuses for not responding to this offer of a heavenly banquet with an entrance price that's being paid and an invitation that is being sent to the world through the foolishness of preaching. And that's what preachers are to do, right? That's our job, is to issue the invitation. Come, oh, for all things are now ready. It's available. It's a, it, it, the price is paid. Come. And yet, the amazing thing is, too, that God wants his house full. I want you to notice that. In verse 23, he says, go out to the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. And so, so if you don't go to heaven, you can't say God didn't want you there. Because he wants the house full. And he wants you in that house. And he's paid the price so you could be in that house. So if you don't go there, it's your own fault. You can't blame anybody else. Because the offer is available. You just have to respond to the offer. That's the bottom line. So what excuses do people come up with in this particular story that Lord Jesus tells? Well, the first excuse is, I guess we say, prosperity. You see, it says, um, the first one, verse 18, they all with one consent began to make excuse. This first said, I have bought a piece of ground. I've got to go see it. I pray they have me excused. Obviously, this guy's a wealthy guy. He just bought some land. He hadn't even looked at it yet. Obviously, had agents to do it for him. You know, it's kind of the wealthy kind of guy that says, oh, I need some land. Go buy me some land. And now we also go see it. In other words, he's got lots of prosperity. And um, sometimes, well, Jesus said this. It's really difficult for rich people to get into heaven. So it's actually easier for the camel to go through the eye of a needle for, than for a rich person. Now, it's not impossible, but it's difficult. You know why it's difficult? Because they've got so many toys and so many projects that keep them from considering eternity. I've got this field. I've got to go look at the field. And so, <clears throat> again, what's keeping you from coming? Are you too prosperous? <clears throat> you don't really consider your true condition? You know, when I go to places like Africa and I talk to them about heaven, you should see the smile on their faces. See, they don't have any remote idea where they're living now is such squalor. The thought of heaven is very appealing. But when you're living in a fancy mansion <laughs> with all comforts there, heaven maybe doesn't feel so appealing. But it will one day when you're in hell, but it'll be too late then. And so, prosperity. Excuse number two, work. Too busy to come. And so another, verse 19 says, I bought five yoke of oxen. And I go to prove them. I pray they have me excused. And so he's just busy with work. And a lot of people, they're just so busy, they don't think about eternity. And the amazing thing is that, you know, at the end of, at the end of it all, you've worked all your life. You know, I used to work uh, in a company and I would help people prepare for retirement. So I, I was a pensions advisor. And so people would call me, and how can I maximize my benefits? So I, And you know the amazing thing? In all the years that I did that, nobody ever asked me what happens after retirement. Hmm. I'll tell you what happens after retirement. Death. Death is the ultimate statistic. One in one dies. And everybody's preparing for retirement. They want to go to play golf in Florida or whatever they want to do. But they're not thinking about what happens after your next breath. Your last breath. What happens after that? You see, you're either going to be at this incredible banquet in the kingdom of God, or you're going to be in the lake of fire, which burns forever and ever. And can you imagine a person who's been so busy and worked all their life and all the rest of it? And you know, one thing that I found when I was in this pensions advisor job, a lot of people never even made retirement. They've got all these plans, all these savings. And then just one heart attack and they're gone. One cancer diagnosis, it's not long, they're gone. 
<clears throat> and so all that work for what? I'm not saying there's dignity in work. Work's good. There's nothing wrong with work. <laughs> but we have to have a bigger picture. We're made for eternity, not for time. There's, we're going to live forever, somewhere. Either with Christ in heaven or in the lake of fire. And so, work is a pretty poor excuse, but it's an excuse that people, I'm just too busy. I'm just too busy. Well, that's <clears throat> excuse number three is family and women. I suppose we could say prosperity is too big to come, work too busy to come, and then family and women too blissful to come. Maybe they're just enjoying, because he says, he said, well, I, uh, he says, uh, I married a wife, therefore I cannot come. Well, I would say, bring your wife. I mean, you could to this breakfast, but <laughs> you, you can to the heavenly banquet. That, that's not restricted to men only. And so bring your wife. <laughs> and, uh, but you see, <clears throat> there, it's interesting how sometimes relationships keep people from the ultimate relationship. Oops. You ever thought about that? Yeah. There, there are people you see, well, what's going to happen to my partner if I accept Christ? Are they are they going to still be, you know, so so we're so concerned about this relationship that we lose out on the ultimate relationship. You see, we were made to have a relationship with God. We'll never find fulfillment outside of that relationship with God. That's, that's where we find our true place in this world is related to God. And so all of these excuses, they're poor, they're fraudulent, they're shallow excuses. <clears throat> when you're in hell, rather than enjoying the heavenly banquet, all these excuses will seem so pathetic, so temporary, so foolish. You could have been dining in the kingdom of God and with his Christ. You see, folks, you have a hell to shun and a heaven to gain. And all depends on what you do with Christ. See, that's the most ultimate question, isn't it, really? What will you do with Christ? That's going to determine the destiny of the human race. He's really the divided. Our country is divided, but let me tell you, the whole world is divided. And what divides the human race is this whether they've accepted Christ or whether they've rejected Christ. That's going to affect their relationships now and throughout eternity. <clears throat> and so, <clears throat> it's interesting the Bible talks a lot. I'm just going to give you some more excuses and uh, the <clears throat> that are elsewhere in the Bible. And uh, you don't have to turn with me, but one of the things that people make uh, excuses about <clears throat> is in connection with conscience. Romans 2.15 says which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts, the meanwhile, accusing or else excusing. <clears throat> so, you know, this conscience is this internal monitor system that God has put in us. It's kind of like a warning light kind of that goes off. When we're tempted to do something, we know we shouldn't do. And what happens is that kind of alarm starts sounding. And so what people do is, um, instead of listening to the voice of conscience, they go ahead and do what the conscience is telling them not to do, and then they excuse it. Well, I just couldn't help it. See, I, I'm, all I'm saying is, we become experts at excusing everything. <clears throat> it's interesting, too, that uh, Paul says in Romans 2, 16, in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. But one of the bases in which God is going to judge the human race is what did they do with the gospel? Did they accept it? Did they reject it? It's going to be the big issue, actually, in eternity. And it says at the end of Romans 3, verse 19, it says, Now we know that whatsoever things the law says, it says to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Isn't that interesting? 
What I'm saying is this, there's a day coming when all the excuses will be over. When people stand before Christ, because everybody has to deal with Jesus Christ, the Bible says all judgment has been given to the Son. So everybody has to deal with Jesus at some point. You either deal with him now, voluntarily, and say, Lord, I want you to be my Savior. I believe you died for me. I, I want you in my life. You, you, you can say that now, or one day you will be before him at the great white throne judgment. And you'll be looking into his eyes, and I just want you to know this, every mouth will be stopped. In other words, when he pre presents the evidence of your rebellion, of your sinfulness, of your rejecting the offer of the invitation that has been given to you time and time and time again, and you might say, oh, but silence in the court. Every mouth will be stopped. The day of excuses will be done. And all the world will be guilty before God. However, it's still not too late. While you're still alive, you still have an opportunity to respond. And it's amazing. You know, the Lord Jesus, this is how he speaks. He, he says this to Jerusalem, but it's equally true to you. He says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which kills the prophets, stones them that are sent to you, how often would I, I have gathered the children together as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings, and ye would not. Isn't that interesting? But like the Lord is saying, I want you in the banquet. I, I would you come. But we said last night, and I say it again, he's a perfect gentleman. He's not going to force anybody to come to that banquet who don't willingly come to him first. And so I would, he says, but you would not. And no doubt they had good excuses for not coming. So by way of summary, man is never without excuses. <clears throat> However, God gets to have the last word. And he says to man, who is never without excuses, thou therefore art inexcusable for oh, now. <laughs> you don't have any excuses. That is in Romans 2, verse 1. Thou art inexcusable, O man, whoever thou art that judges, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, and thou that judgest doest the same thing. And so what he says is this, and it's a really interesting point that he's making, is that we're good at judging other people. Is that true? Amen. So I say, you know, like I've, I've done door to door work and I've gone into a posh neighborhood and they've said to me, oh, you need to go to the projects. I've actually had that said to me. You need to go down to the projects. They need this message. So in their minds, they're making a judgment, aren't they? They're saying, well, the people in the projects, they need this message, but I don't. So they're saying they know the difference between right and wrong. They're making some kind of judgment call. And that's what he said. The human race, when I was making judgment calls about others, well, that what that guy did is terrible. What that guy, that person did is awful. By making those judgments, we're saying we know the difference between right and wrong. And the problem is, although we know the difference between right and wrong, and everyone in this room does, so often we do the wrong. <laughs> we know is wrong, and so we're without excuse. So God is going to show man that they're inexcusable, that they've had within them this conscience, they've had within them this ability to judge between right and wrong. Uh, uh, they've also rejected creation, the invisible things of him from the creation of the world they're clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power in Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Romans 1.20. Can you see this? Man, God is, God is saying, man... You're full of excuses, but you have no excuse. Conscience, creation, your ability to judge between right and wrong, all these things testify to the fact that you are a moral being. And you know that you're a sinner. Keep excusing it. 
And it's time to stop excusing it and just do the ABC. We've often talked about that here. A, admit that you're a hell-deserving sinner. That's the heart of the beginning of the gospel message. It's recognizing you need a savior. B, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And you will be saved. You will get to go to the banquet if you believe on believe, believe what? Believe that he is who he claimed to be, that he is the eternal son of God who died on the cross, was buried and rose again the third day for your justification so you could be made right before God. Believe on him. And then C is call. And it's just interesting. The scripture says, whoever, don't you just love that? Whoever, whatever your background, whatever you've done, however bad you've been, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then you get to go in the best banquet ever. And it won't end. This one's going to end pretty soon. But this banquet is going to be forever. And so I would hate for you, personally, it would be a terrible thing if one day you find yourself in the lake of fire. I hope that doesn't happen. Because you don't have to be there. There's an alternative. It's a wonderful alternative. And it's not just about when you die. You see, the Christian life, I've said this many times, it's not just pie in the sky when you die. It's steak on the plate while you wait. <laughs> it's the best life there is. Because it's the way you were made. You were made to have a relationship with God. Well, if you're not enjoying that, you're, you're, you're out, of, out of kilter. You're not the way it should be. And so it makes a difference to your life now. It's transforming. You say, oh, I could never live the Christian life. Yeah, that's true. You never could. But God goes so far, he'll even put his Holy Spirit within you to enable you to live the life. He'll, he'll take care of everything. You just have got to come. You've got, and, and again, I, I, you notice it says he had compelled them to come in. I beseech you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God and to do it now before it's too late. If you've never trusted Christ, can I urge you, do it today, do it this morning because you're never going to guarantee your next breath. And so this is the time. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the day to respond to the offer. Compel them to come in. If we can do anything to persuade you, to talk to you, to convince you, we have a booklet here, consider the evidence. We, we, don't, we don't want you to, to go without proper evidence. This is not some kind of uh, blind faith. This is based on genuine, real evidence. And so... Please take a booklet if you've never considered these things. But we would hate to think that you came to this banquet, but you missed out on the real one. So please consider these things. Let me just close in prayer. If anybody wants to talk to me afterward, some of the people that maybe invited you, uh, we would love to talk to you and explain to you the way of God more perfectly. Let's pray. Father, we just uh, we pray for the day of excuses to be done. And that uh, we would, people in this room would accept that invitation to the most wonderful heavenly banquet. We pray, Father, too, uh, for those of us that already are believers to stop making excuses and start living wholeheartedly for the one who has done so much for us, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen.